name is Dan Hedinger. I am the biochar facility manager at Livingwood Farms. And um, I want to spend the night talking about urine and um, waste not project, just a little bit about that. Um, it, my, my goal here is to give us a broader understanding of just regular household waste, um, meaning we're gonna get into a little bit of history and we'll get into a little bit of chemistry. And we're gonna use that history and chemistry to help guide us in finding current applications for these waste. Um, you may have seen some of my work with wood ash that we did a few years ago. And um, in the future, I hope to keep this going. I wanna do something with paper and cardboard and uh, done a little bit of work with bones lately too. So looking forward to sharing that with you. So let's get into it. Waste not urine. Urine is wonderful in rich history. And um, I gotta say, this is one of the early stories that I ran into and uh, really got me motivated for looking further into this whole entire subject. Um, the story of Hennig Brand is a wonderful story of accidental discovery. It's one of those 16th century, 17th century alchemists looking for the philosopher's stone. This is the, um, the key to changing base metals into gold and where else to look but liquid gold itself. Um, Hennig Brand accidentally discovered phosphorus, the element phosphorus, while heating the residues of 5,500 liters of boiled down urine. And consequently, he was distilling phosphorus from urine. And you can imagine his surprise when his glassware started to glow. And he named this substance phosphorus, phos meaning light, and four meaning bearing. So phosphorus meaning light bearing. Um, you may recognize the word phosphorescence comes from phosphorus. So at the time, phosphorus itself, of course, was not understood to be a fertilizer yet, but urine was already being widely collected and stored for a variety of early industrial applications. Many industrial applications. Uh, sal ammoniac, if I'm saying that right, is an ammonium chloride salt that was also popular with the alchemist. Um, it, it dissolves easily in water and um, uh, it dissolves into ammonia and hydrochloric acid, so that helps to dissolve metals. Um, also used in laundry as a cleaning agent, used in the production of alum. Uh, in medieval Europe and as late as Civil War United States of America, um, it was used widely in the production of saltpeter. Uh, and I'll be sharing more on this later. Of course, we know it's been used as a fertilizer, especially in Asia. Uh, where in his turn of the century travelogue, Farmers of 40 Centuries, F.H. King describes his visit to China where collection vessels were placed on the sides of roads and even in railway stations. And uh, the, the collection vessels were maintained to be comfortable so that it would encourage you to stop by and deposit your urine. Uh, pictured here, you may be wondering, is um, urine used in uh, dye applications. So what you see here is um, indigo extraction. And what you see here is a lichen-based dye. So I wanted to share that with you right away. If you're in Western North Carolina and you go out in the woods, you might see growing on the sides of rocks this type of lichen, colloquially called rock tripe. I'm not going to try to say the scientific name. But um, rock tripe has a way of getting hard and crusting and then falling off the rock where you can go and then collect it off the ground. Right? So if you take rock tripe and you were to soak it in ammonia, then you're going to start to get this um, kind of purplish dye that you see here on the top. Well, that's not ammonia. That's urine. So that's urine that has um, fermented over time and actually becomes uh, ammonia itself. So I want to show you this. This towel right here. See that? Yeah, I don't know if you can see that beautiful, I think it's beautiful, pink, light pink, purple color. That is dyed with urine and rock tripe. So let's get into this indigo a little bit. Let's go ahead and do this. Uh, a really, um, exciting and kind of fascinating story of how urine was used in medieval Europe. 
uh, was in the um, dyeing of indigo goods, indigo being the color of um, blue jeans. So um, what I've done here is taken some indigo powder and have put it in this little sock thing down here. And from there, I've taken it and submerged that sock into, that's about a two gallon vat of urine. Um, the urine vat is um, called, nobody really knows the etymology of this word, but sig vat basically just means urine vat. And that urine vat is used to make the indigo powder soluble so that it adheres to cellulose fibers like cotton or linen. And um, indigo, natural indigo still these days requires um, a solution that is both um, reduced, meaning that it's limited oxygen, and also um, alkaline. So uh, uniquely, urine, when you leave it alone long enough, and you just leave it just vented to the air just a little bit, um, there are microbes in the urine that will reduce the indigo powder, and slowly over time, your urine will become more alkaline as it sits. So urine being uniquely capable of taking indigo and making it soluble so that it sticks to dyed goods. Um, it's really pretty neat. When you see this, this vat turn green, um, you know that it's ready to dip your, your cotton piece in there. And then um, you pull it out and the soluble indigo is stuck to your cotton piece and it turns, it's green when you pull it out and immediately upon exposure to air, it turns blue. So you can imagine that this was quite magical to the ancients. Um, and I want to go ahead and show you this as well. This is a urine dyed indigo cloth that I made um, last year at the biochar facility. So there's uh, some more of my cotton dish towels that I made. Um, you can see that's a very nice, pure, dark blue. Uh, there's a really fun story about indigo dyed goods. Um, urine being uh, a, a, a gentle way to dye with uh, indigo. Um, urine is, is weak compared to some of the chemical methods that were coming out in the, uh, I wanna say 18th or 19th century um, for reducing indigo. And meaning that uh, it takes multiple dips into the sig vat and back out in order to get this deep base of blue. So there's multiple dips, and the fact that the ammonia is rather weak chemically uh, mean that you have a really high quality cotton or linen garment that has a really deep, deep shade of blue. Uh, so much so that compared to some of the industrial methods of, of indigo dyeing at the time, uh, urine was actually uh, prized for a little while. So traders of indigo dyed goods would actually smell the urine soaked cloth and to be able to confirm that it was in fact dyed with urine and that would fetch a higher price. Um, this story is, is uh, detailed in a, uh, in a book by J.N. Lyles called uh, The Art and Craft of Natural Dying. Um, that's been a really fun book for me to get into and uh, uh, a lot of this waste knot stuff actually stems from just uh, stories about um, dying in ancient times that come from that book. So um, uh, nonetheless, you can see that the prevalence of urine in such a broad array of historical applications um, affirms clearly that our modern day aversion to urine uh, with our flush toilets is an exception to our natural history. Modern sanitation, flush and forget. Modern sanitation um, brought on by urban living and our distance from agriculture, cheap synthetic fertilizers, cheap energy, odor, public perception, flush toilet technologies. These are all reasons why we don't collect our urine anymore. All in one pipe, waste disposal. So you flush, you, you pee into the toilet and you flush it or you um, defecate into the toilet and you flush it, you're taking your urine, you're taking your feces, and you're taking all of that water and you're diluting those nutrients and you're making it very hard to reclaim nutrients at that point. So diluted nutrient is harder to reclaim and what is reclaimed currently is what we call biosolids. 
um, which can be contaminated with other household waste or anything else that goes down the sewer. Um, modern sanitation is very effective at managing pathogens, um, but outflows at a modern wastewater treatment plant, I don't want to say all of them, but a lot of them, still contain plant nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, which contribute to, um, certainly not solely responsible for, but they contribute to eutrophication. Eutrophication is a form of nutrient pollution where excess nutrients in waterways cause biological blooms that disrupt ecosystems. If you've ever seen the algal blooms that are brought on by excess nitrogen in the water, those algal blooms will um, block sunlight access to the water. They'll um, use up all the oxygen, leading to pretty dramatic fish kills. Um, it won't take long to come across a story about eutrophication in America in the news very recently. Uh, ecological sanitation is kind of a, um, a, a, an ecologically minded approach that looks at modern day sanitation and uh, looks at how can we reclaim nutrients. Uh, how can we stop potential eutrophication? How can we use those nutrients in agriculture? Um, there's going to be a couple of organizations that I'm going to refer to a few times throughout tonight's lecture. Um, organizations like the Stockholm Environment Institute, um, which put out a lot of research, and others, I don't want to just say them, but others in mainly Sweden, uh, a little bit in Germany, um, that wrote a lot about urine diversion and collection and use in agriculture. Uh, I want to say that was probably about 10 or maybe even 20 years ago. And then also I'll be talking a lot about the Rich Earth Institute um, in Vermont in the United States. These guys have been leaders in ecological sanitation and um, I'll be mentioning them a lot throughout this presentation. Uh, a lot of what they're going for is what we call a closed loop nutrient cycle where where you urinate and your urine is collected and it's supplied in agriculture and eventually that urine is used to grow food that you then eat and then urinate and you complete the cycle. These are, are complete systems approaches that look at energy efficiency, uh, cost of fertilizer, um, you know, what does it take to actually store and collect this urine and ship it, move it to where it's needed and um, and then, you know, what is the safety and how can we recommend safe practices for urine and how can we recommend legislation that, that makes this possible in the United States? Um, uh, urine diversion here is, is really is the central approach to ecological sanitation. Let me show you why. This comes from one of those uh, Swedish documents that I was describing. Um, uh, take a look at this graph here, you're going to see the three of the main plant nutrients, the NPK um, that you see on a fertilizer bag, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Urine is, is um, what's blue here, dark blue. In your urine, of all of your waste that goes down the pipe, say out to your sewer, in your, in your wastewater, uh, urine contains 80% of your nitrogen. Uh, I want to say that's 55 or 60 percent, 55 percent of your phosphorus and 60 percent of your potassium. So that's the majority on all accounts. That's the majority. That's very much close to all of your nitrogen in your urine alone, which is only one percent or less than one percent of your total domestic wastewater. So you can see why it would be effective to uh, divert urine from your wastewater stream. This actually makes it easier for modern day wastewater treatment plants to operate. Uh, removal of nutrients is a big part of what they do. So if you can remove the nutrients at your home, then they don't have to deal with it. Um, uh, urine really is the low hanging fruit. It has very big potential, as you can see, as a fertilizer. It's a fast acting and it's a soluble form of nitrogen and phosphorus. Very effective, as effective as mineral fertilizers, proven as effective or um, just barely as effective in some studies as mineral fertilizers. Use it as a fertilizer in your home. There's no need to flush every time you uh, urinate, so you're saving water. Uh, and we've already spoken about the waterways. Urine itself is, is actually pretty well balanced for nitrogen heavy feeder crops. These are cereal crops and uh, leafy greens. Um, 
Uh, phosphorus is increasingly limited uh, globally, so um, urine really does help solve that problem. Uh, of course, it's free and it's local. You're independent uh, generator of your own fertilizer. Uh, frankly, I think this makes you a more responsible person. And uh, this is maybe just me talking, reading too many stories, but I, I do believe that this gives you a deeper connection to, uh, to who you are and where you came from. Uh, Western science itself, uh, you know, a lot of talk about urine as a fertilizer now, a lot of research going into it, and the science is increasingly clear. Urine is safe. Uh, it's very safe, and of course it's effective, and it's everywhere. Urine has a very big potential in the developing world, of course, where, um, where we need as much food as possible. Um, Rich Earth estimates that, um, uh, well, they don't estimate. They, they've tested plenty of urine that they've taken in through their community um, urine collection program. And their MPK that they average out is a 0 0.6 in 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Okay? Um, for their figures, that's two and a half pounds of nitrogen in 50 gallons of urine. Okay? So uh, moving forward, since uh, urine is so nitrogen dominant, we're going to really be looking at nitrogen as the determining factor here. Um, uh, as I said, it is as effective as mineral fertilizers. In some cases, it's even better. Uh, I did come across one trial. This is fascinating, uh, where they were growing tomatoes um, fertilized with urine compared to mineral fertilizers, and uh, these tomatoes show lower nitrates, believe it or not, um, higher beta-carotene, and higher protein, believe it or not. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's pretty cool to me. Um, uh, average adult, these are common figures placed all around the web. Uh, average adult urinates one and a half liters a day. I personally know that I urinate quite a bit more than that. Maybe I just drink more water or coffee. <laughs> um, but um, throughout the entire year, this is, um, again, often quoted, this is enough to fertilize a 145 kilogram annual wheat crop. So uh, you collect all of your urine all of the time, and you can do 145 kilograms of wheat. Um, by my rough math, uh, urine from about 20 people would be enough to replace all of the nitrogen loss from one acre of maize. Um, of course, it remains difficult to satisfy all of the nitrogen um, requirement via urine at a large scale. Um, urine is a highly soluble form of fertilizer, but um, you know, it's, it's my position, it's probably the position, I can't speak for the entire farm, but uh, I would assume it's the position of Ligwin Farms, that urine is, is useful as a fast-acting, soluble nitrogen fertilizer, but useful in the context of a broader soil health, um, which really goes alongside a complete system of regenerative ag, including no-till, including nitrogen-fixing cover crops, uh, tons of compost, uh, lots of intensive grazing, and of course, being the biochar facility manager, I'll be advocating biochar.